Left Behind is an insulting, ridiculous mess that makes me want to punch all of you listening in the face. The plot sounds amazing. A small group of survivors are left behind after millions of people suddenly vanish and the world is plunged into chaos and destruction, let alone that Nicolas Cage is our handsome leading man here. But when the first review on IMDb is headlined with, one star, I want my money back, you have to wonder just what went wrong here. Turns out this movie is a remake of a film which was based on a book of the same name from the year 2000, except the movie is added after Left Behind. And that one starred Kirk Cameron. Yes, Kirk Cameron, the alien. I think if you've been following the search for the worst for a while now, you can probably guess where this is going. Kirk Cameron likes to star in Christian propaganda basically, and that's what this film effectively is. Terrible, awful Christian propaganda. Except instead of an alien being the main character, it's a crazy, bird-looking man who always looks confused as to where he actually is. So it turns out Nicolas Cage decided to do this movie because his brother is a pastor and said he should be in it, because it would be great for, you know, the Christians and whatnot. It also helps that he was paid $3 million for 10 days of work. That's $300,000 a day. <laughs> Wow. I'm going to explain to you why this film sucks now. No time is wasted as the film opens with one of the main characters being established as coming home from somewhere. You know what, to make this easier, I'm going to reference every character in terms of how they're related to Nicolas Cage in this movie. So this blonde woman is Nicolas Cage's daughter. She's informed by Nicolas Cage's wife that Nicolas Cage can't make it to Nicolas Cage's surprise birthday party because he's working. Be prepared to hear Nicolas Cage dozens of times in this video until I get bored and give up. Wow, I wonder if Nicolas Cage was actually there for that totally not Photoshop family portrait. Some famous journalist shows up who's the love interest for Nicolas Cage's daughter, kind of, sort of, but not really, a little bit. I don't know. He signs a bunch of autographs and I'm left wondering how weird and dated this situation seems. Since when does anyone like recognize a journalist? An investigative journalist, like what? Investigative journalist. Remember? Some crazy woman asks if he reads the Bible. Then when he says no, she quotes the Bible at him. Well, Matthew 24, verse 7 says that there shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. I only say she's crazy because this is a very strange question to ask somebody out of the blue. Nicolas Cage's daughter butts in with a completely reasonable retort to the religious scripture, and they have an edgy little argument about why God is real or not real. Honey, God knows everything. So then why doesn't he do something? <laughs> Obviously, this is supposed to be the moment where we all gasp and say, You dumb bitch, how dare you say that about God? I damn you to hell unless you think what I think. But I expect most people, that, that's including rational Christians, will not be victim to the narrative this film is trying to push onto its audience. Because it's stupid and incredibly ham-fisted. Sorry to interrupt. Finally, Nicolas Cage shows up in a suitably slimy scene where he slips off his wedding ring so he can go flirt with his hot air hostess. His character's name is Rayford Steele. What is he, a G.I. Joe? Back to journalist who totally wants to pound Nicolas Cage's daughter. He describes the religious lady she just had a debate with as being nutty. Nutty lady. And she explains that her mum is so religious that she thinks she's wacko. I've decided to go with wacko. 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 Again, setting up everyone for the See, I told you you should be a Christian moment. <laughs> oh, I'm slaying. Subtlety and Nicolas Cage are two words that don't belong in the same sentence and it's pretty wonderful. For some reason, Nicolas Cage acknowledges the journalist by name. You're Cameron Williams, holy cow. <laughs> and I have no idea why. I guess because he's so famous and that he's a main character in the story. I don't know why they make such a big deal out of everyone recognizing him because, I mean, the fact that he's a journalist isn't exactly that important to the story. I guess it's either because that's what he was in the book or because it's the only excuse they could think of for him having a DSLR camera later in the plane sequences. How's school? It's good. It's good, yeah. <clears throat> the entire first sequence is just scene after scene of the script purposefully making fun of Christians for being crazy. It's all very silly, heavy-handed, cheesy, flat, and most of all... Going my way. Boring. Unless Nicolas Cage is there, he is, he is a darling. The journalist and Cage's daughter 
part ways so we can get onto the plane heading to London that's being piloted by Nicolas Cage. Did I mention that Nicolas Cage is in this movie? The film really struggles to come up with reasons for characters to talk to each other and interact. Like when the journalist man sits down on the plane, this guy asks him if he got Nicolas Cage's daughter's number, despite him never meeting him before and explaining that he was watching them and saw what they were doing. Like a creepy weirdo. And he just responds as if that's like a normal thing. Hey, I was spying on you. Only as a thank you though for hooking the brother up with first class. Huh? I know you. Look, George. It's Frank Sinatra. What's that? It's Frank. Oh! If I'm gonna give credit anywhere, it's that if these ridiculous Christian movies are good at anything, it's being horribly unfunny. Take note of this guy who's very clearly a Muslim. He'll be important later. There's also this guy who's a character actor you'll probably recognize from movies like Pirates of the Caribbean. I don't know what the correct nomenclature for people of his size is anymore, so I'm just gonna call him Mini-Me. I'm sure that won't offend anyone. I've never even seen Austin Powers. Fuck you! The plane finally takes off and we're still waiting for people to be left behind. And then we all yawn because where is the apocalypse already? I want death and destruction. I was promised death, chaos and destruction, goddammit. Nicolas Cage's daughter arrives home and is greeted by her much younger brother who she has a gift for. The brand new baseball glove that I've been asking for. No way! We see our first Bible because remember to be a Christian, everybody. There's a bizarre scene back on the plane where these two characters we've never been introduced to before have a conversation about how a plane is secretly being invented by the Defense Department that can fly 300 passages from New York to London in six minutes. The Asian guy then says it's probably been reverse engineered from alien technology. Probably something from Area 51. Yeah. Scotch, please. <laughs> This is only loosely mentioned here to be funny and also so it can be referenced again later and be equally unfunny. I don't have much else to say except why was this in the movie? I think it was supposed to be really funny and wacky, but I just find it mostly confusing. You could take this scene out of the movie and absolutely nothing would change at all. There's some tension between Nicolas Cage's wife who's religious and the atheist Nicolas Cage's daughter. I've made this so needlessly confusing. And then she leaves in a huff. Mini-Me has a go at the Muslim who kindly offers him some help with his luggage. Then he has a conversation with the kid sitting opposite him about American football. Your dad plays ball on TV? Go Jets! I'm just as confused as you are. I'm relatively sure all of these random scenes of passengers in the plane are the dictionary definition of filler. I really don't think this film would have enough content without these scenes to actually be classed as a movie. It would be like 25 minutes long. Nick Cage's daughter takes her brother to the mall, and after one more conversation about why their mum is crazy for being religious... Do you think mom's crazy? It finally happens. <laughs> 30 minutes in and everyone who's not a devout Christian is left behind. There's an entertaining few minutes where everyone goes crazy because all the Christians disappeared. Then for some reason a bunch of children's clothing just kind of falls from the sky or something. It's never really explained. Of course at this point in the movie we're not supposed to know that it was just the Christians who were taken away. But it's, it's pretty flipping obvious. Wait. Wait, why did, why did I just filter myself? This isn't a kid's show. You'd have to be a blind, retarded, fucking indoctrinated hyper-Christian to not notice this. Uh, too far? While Nicolas Cage was out of the cockpit chilling with the passengers, the co-pilot was beamed up to heaven so the plane starts to plummet. Why the pilot would leave the cabin, I have no idea. Luckily, Nicolas Cage saves the day because he's an epic hero. So now is really when the film either becomes even more unsufferable or 20 times more entertaining to you because it's just so... So, so stupid. This material has such little faith in the human race that after all worthy Christians are miraculously beamed off Earth, it immediately descends into utter chaos. Murder, shoplifting, anger, rage. Within seconds, society seems to be in complete ruin. Now, I know there are a lot of Christians in the world. I believe they make up just under a third of the entire population of planet Earth. But they would still be, you know like two thirds of the planet left, if not more because in this universe only the worthy Christians seem to have been taken away. How that is decided by God, we'll discuss later. I'd like to think that our first reaction to this happening in the real world wouldn't be to immediately murder each other and steal TVs from shops, but maybe that's just me being too optimistic. Anyway, the journalist pulls out his camera and starts documenting this crazy event because they somewhat understandably think it has only happened to them on this one plane. But for some reason, a group of angry passengers tries to storm their way into the pilot's cabin, even though I'm not sure how he would know anything more than any of them. He was just flying the fucking plane. Cage flips down the oxygen masks and says everyone needs to sit down through the intercom. 
and they just kind of do it. Let's quickly talk about the way this film is edited. You've probably noticed that the two different storylines seem to be shown to us at completely random times. Usually you'd hope that when you have two different stories going on simultaneously, you'd ideally either hope for some kind of link where changes in one story affect the other, or at the very minimum a type of pacing that constantly leaves you on a mini cliffhanger as each scene ends to build momentum and eventually ends with some kind of payoff. Obviously the two stories are going to intersect at some point in this movie, but when that is, is only in service to the clumsy and awkward script, as opposed to making sense naturally in the world of this movie. So because this film has no idea what it's doing, you end up with random scenes like the one earlier about the secret government projects that are nothing but pointless filler that adds nothing to the greater narrative, or like this scene where we're at now, where a small plane crashes near Nicolas Cage's daughter. Apart from being some mindless action or a representation of the spectacle of this event, it really has no point, and within seconds we're back on the plane. I don't know about you, but it always bugs me in movies when they have these fake UIs for phones or computers. Like, what phone in the whole universe even looks like that? I realise it's probably because they want to avoid any potential legal problems with Apple or Google, but it's a nitpick that always bugs me nevertheless. Also, make sure you remember that there is no satellite around here, and he can't get reception on his phone. There's an unintentionally hilarious scene where the journalist points his camera in the face of some poor mother whose child has been beamed up to heaven. Ma'am, can you tell me what you saw? I think it's just the fact that she's awkwardly holding that stupid hippo. <laughs> this is so utterly ridiculous. Why would they go out of their way to do that to her? For no reason, an empty school bus falls off a bridge and then it cuts away. This is all of what Nick Cage's daughter's scenes are like for the next half an hour. Completely pointless, meaningless chaos. We're introduced to a truly awful English actor who claims, I know what's going on here. What do you know? It turns out she's a drug addict, who then says that none of this is happening. None of this is happening. Yet another completely pointless interaction that means nothing. The Muslim man stands up and says to everyone that they should all pray to God for what has happened. Uh, I think what we should all be doing right now is saying a prayer. A prayer? Then Minimi very aggressively rails him for being a Muslim and implies that he's suspicious that it was him who caused this crazy event to happen. Nicolas Cage decides to turn the plane around and go back to New York. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Get in there. Get in there. Back on the ground, we see the daughter running around desperately trying to find her brother. But notice how there are still policemen holding people back, as well as an ambulance that is helping injure people. So has society completely collapsed or not? It's like this movie can't decide. Are you telling me that just because every loyal Christian was warped into heaven, that would mean that every means of communication would instantly go down for Nicolas Cage on the plane? There is absolutely no logical consistency with the kind of destruction that would happen in this insane scenario within the confines of this movie. There's a pointless action scene where the plane is on a collision course with another airline that I guess was 100% made up of Christians because it seems to be completely empty. I'm gonna move on because the amount of questions this brings up is more frustrating than acknowledging anything else. Minimi snoops through the Muslim's bag to try and find anything suspicious. <laughs> then for no reason other than dramatic effect, he pulls some unknown object out of the bag and it's implied that it was a firearm of some sort. <laughs> Daughter gets a shotgun in her face and it's utterly moronic. Wow, so it turns out the Muslim guy isn't holding a gun, it's an electric toothbrush. Wow, what a clever and well-written bait and switch. No, but really, why did this happen? Why did he threaten him with the toothbrush in that aggressive gun-like hand movement? Was it to trick the audience with a contrived conflict to make you flip-flop between trusting the Muslim guy? What am I supposed to think? It makes no sense. Nicolas Cage's daughter breaks her way into a hospital for some reason and finds the baby ward. Of course all the babies are gone because under this movie's rules, every child is innocent and gets to go to heaven no matter what. I think it would be a good time to acknowledge how the logic that this movie goes by makes no sense at all. So the only people who were taken to heaven were the true Christians, right? Or those who can be considered innocent or pure in the eyes of God, aka children or babies, but every Christian character in this movie is presented as a heavy-handed crazed lunatic who lets religion completely rule their life, which in Nicolas Cage's wife's instance has completely ruined her marriage, her relationship with her daughter, and is on her way to ruining her son as well. Do you think mom's crazy? This is not me trying to spin the religious aspects of this movie into some kind of agenda, I'm simply stating what has been presented to me within the confines of the movie. So then we move on to the full-on insulting and offensive part of this thinking. And I don't think using those words is too far. Think about what the movie is implying here. It's saying that if you flirt with another woman while you're married, don't believe in God because you need more evidence, are a drug addict, or worst of all, 
that you don't practice the exact same branch of Christianity or any other religion, you are wrong and deserve to be punished in the eyes of the god that is in this movie. Earlier on, the daughter character exclaims that she doesn't want a god who causes natural disasters and needless death and torture. I mean, he is god, right? Couldn't he stop a flood if he wanted to? Maybe send a little rain to it's stop a It's a fallen world. This character constantly drones on about how horrible all of it is and goes out of her way to condemn this idea. God did not bring me home. I brought me home. I bought the ticket, I got on the flight. God had nothing to do with it. And all that happens is that she's proven right. God is an absolute prick in this movie. This isn't the Christian God. At least I fucking hope it isn't. <laughs> The simplistic and reductive way this movie plays around with religion should not only just be insulting to everyone, but most of all to people who practice Christianity. How could anyone watch this movie and nod along with its message? You'd have to be an absolute crazed lunatic to tell me that these flawed people who have made human mistakes deserve to be punished, and a lot of the people have seemingly done nothing at all. Like, what did this old lady do? What did Mini-Me do? Are you telling me that being a serial killer is just as bad as someone who's addicted to drugs for some reason that isn't even explained in the movie? You know what, maybe the god from this film does exist in real life. But if it followed the logic of this film, it wouldn't be able to take anyone up to heaven because humans are complex and nuanced and you can't define if someone is a good or worthy person based on if they've ever flirted with someone or questioned blind faith or taken drugs or whatever petty notion this film condemns. This is why I consider this film to be completely hopeless, despite its admittedly bland competency in terms of how it was put together technically. A message like this makes a film so much worse to me than anything any amazing bulk of a it can. It's in its own playing field of bad and insulting. Right, rant over, let's finish this shit. They lose the autopilot from the collision earlier, and the fuel is leaking so they don't have much longer in the air. Oh, come on, dogs do have souls. Fuck off. So I don't know what you think's going on here, but you need to- <laughs> Get up! <laughs> Wait, wh what? This is the worst shit I've ever seen. How on earth did she get a gun onto a commercial airline? This is so stupid. The terrible English woman explains what is going on because whatever, it's not important. It was God. Don't tell me you believe this. It doesn't matter what I believe. Actually, mate, in this movie, it does matter what you believe. You used your free will to choose the wrong option in life. So now you're doomed to a future of damnation and chaos. Bad luck. No, no. <laughs> Nicolas Cage realizes that his wife was right all along, and it's supposed to be this really cute, aww, moment. But I'm just left here thinking, what the hell, man? You haven't done anything wrong. Like in the movie, he hasn't even cheated on his wife. He was just playing around with the idea. And even then, while being immoral, that doesn't necessarily make him an evil person, especially considering the circumstances in the movie, does it? Or am I the crazy one? I don't even know anymore. I'm sick of commenting on these stupid side characters and I've skipped loads of the pointless scenes out, but this one is just too baffling to not comment on. Out of nowhere, two characters who have never spoken to each other have a heartfelt scene where this guy explains that he used to know her dad and then it devolves into this speech about how he wishes he spent more time with his own daughter and I don't know what to say. I, I don't even know either of their fucking names. You probably don't remember, we met once. Nicolas Cage's daughter climbs to the top of a bridge to kill herself, or to look at the moon. Either will do. All of a sudden, the phones conveniently start working, so then even more stupidity can happen. So yeah, this is how the stories link. Thank you. The daughter is tasked with helping the plane land by clearing a runway. The plane lands safely, but nothing matters because the film ends with the passenger staring at New York, which is in flames, for some inexplicable reason. What happened? How, how did a fire that devastating, like, Start. I guess it doesn't matter. The final gut punch is the most cliche line in history about how this is all just the beginning. I'm afraid this is just the beginning. The film ends on a quote from the Bible, but I have a much more fitting quote for the end. How about, God is a dick. Oh wait, no, no, I've got a better one. Let's all thank God that Indiegogo for the sequel was a huge failure. Left Behind is a masterpiece in how to insult the audience. If you want to piss everyone off at the same time as being boring, 
creatively and stylistically anemic, then go ahead and just copy everything this film does. Honestly, I have a massive urge to place this as the lowest ranking movie because of how annoyed the message makes me. But ultimately, if you look past it, there are some scenes that are so appallingly bad that there is some genuine enjoyment to be had from the terrible acting from Nicolas Cage and literally everyone else. I think if you were making a movie and you did everything opposite to Left Behind, you'd have a pretty fantastic movie. That's how little it gets right overall. I hate this movie with every fragment of my soul, and I hope I've been able to convey exactly why within this horribly long video. I'm not going to tell you what the next movie is that I'm covering, because I want it to be a surprise, but it does kill me inside every time I think about it, which usually is a good sign for these things. Thank you for watching if you've made it this far, and if you have made it this far, make sure you leave a comment saying, Wow, you're so epic, IHE. Haha, <laughs> have a sub from me. I'll see you on the next video, and thanks for being patient with my slow uploads lately. Bye!